It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. People wonder why I greet them at God's house in the evening by saying good morning. <laughs> and it's because it's always like a brand new day. Whenever we're in the house of God, whatever time of the day it is. If you turn with me to Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, I'm going to be speaking about seeking the lost. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say unto you that likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Let us pray. Father, you are God. You have all power and all might, all authority. You know all things. I pray that during this time, especially at this hour, that you would open up every heart to receive, every ear to hear and apply this word that you may be glorified in all that we say, in all that we do. In Christ's most precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The context we're looking at today, as we've been going through and preaching the gospel of Luke a verse at a time, Jesus has just concluded his teaching on what it means to be a disciple of his. He had taught that he must be the first love, that his disciples must bear the cross to follow him, and that they must forsake all. He had given a very tough message he had not stooped to tickle anyone's ear. He didn't say what people just wanted to hear. He spoke truth. And he spoke it boldly about what it means to be his disciple. It's interesting to see that at the end of Luke 35, at the end of that teaching that Jesus gave about being his disciple, he said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, you're probably wondering, what does that mean? He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, it means this. It means that he knew that there would be people in the crowd that would have spiritual ears to hear and understand what he was teaching. And at the same time, there would be those in the crowd that did not have the spiritual insight, the spiritual ears to hear what he had to say. There are three groups of people mentioned here. We could really split them down to two. But it's mentioned that there are scribes, there are Pharisees, there are publicans, there are sinners. I know that sounds like four, 
But literally, publicans and sinners are one group. They're sinners. Uh, we would refer to them as unrighteous. And the scribes and the Pharisees is one group as well because the scribes were mostly Pharisees. And so we have three people groups, kind of, really two. And in response to this plea, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. There were those who gathered around Christ because they wanted to hear more. The message had been tough. It was exacting. I think there are a lot of people in our world today who would say that the message that Jesus Christ gave in Luke 14, verse 25 through 35, was rather radical. But Christ wants true disciples. Not superficial followers. He wants dedicated people committed to follow him all the way to fight the fight to keep the faith to finish the course so there were people that did gather to him they were known as publicans and sinners the important thing we need to know is that publican and sinners publicans and sinners were looked down upon they were seen by the religious leaders of Israel as being unworthy, unclean. Uh, you didn't do anything with them. You ignored them. You had nothing to do with them. They were looked down upon as out, outcasts of society. They wanted to hear, hear more. They were sinners who knew they were sinners. They were publicans who knew they were sinners. What is a publican? A publican was a Jew who collected taxes for Rome. Think about that. Rome ruled Israel you got people collecting taxes for Rome, and they're Jewish. Well, you can understand how and why then the publicans were looked down upon as traitors, traitors to their own country. But Jesus associated with publicans. He associated with other sinners as well. And if I could go so far as to say, there are many today in churches all over the place who choose to have nothing to do with the unrighteous. They have nothing to do with them. It's interesting to note that not only did Jesus associate with sinners and publicans in particular, but one of his own disciples was a publican. Let me say a former publican. From Luke chapter 5, verse 27 through 31, we see Jesus called a tax collector to be his disciple. And when he did, I want you to know that his disciples encountered the scorn of the Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders. Jesus saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. And Levi left all, rose up, and followed him. Well, it turns out that Levi made a great feast in his house, for Christ and other publicans, other sinners to come and gather there. And they sat down with them. And the scribes and the Pharisees murmured against his disciples saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? 
Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What is Jesus saying? Self-righteous people, like the Pharisees, cannot be saved until they shed their self-righteousness and recognize that they're a sinner in need of a Savior, a sinner in need of Christ. Unless they forsake their self-righteousness and repent, they can't be saved. So Jesus was scorned by the religious leaders of Israel because he was a friend of publicans and sinners. He was concerned for their immortal soul. He cared for them. In Matthew 11, verse 18 and 19, Jesus speaks of his accusers. This is what his accusers said about him. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a devil. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Jesus was known as a friend of publicans and sinners. With that in mind, later in his ministry, Matthew 21, verse 31, Jesus will confront Jewish leaders. This is what he'd say to them. Verily I say unto you that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. I want you to recognize what a shock that would be to the religious leaders of that day who think that they're right with God. They're self-righteous. They have no need to repent. Wow. Publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. When they believed him, they paid heed to what John preached. but not the religious leaders of Israel. Publicans and sinners were drawn to Christ. And I want everybody to know why and how they were drawn to Christ. Because Jesus loved them. Jesus was concerned for their plight. Jesus wanted to see them get saved by placing their trust in him. They saw the love of Christ. Luke 7, verse 37 through 39 tells us about a woman, a sinner, who came seeking Christ. Because she noticed the difference. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself. Listen carefully. This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. 
The Pharisee was so self-righteous, so full of himself, that he thought it even inappropriate to be in the presence of an unrighteous person. The Pharisee looked down upon people like that. They looked down upon Jesus for associating with them. So Jesus concludes his teaching on the cost of discipleship. There were some who heard what he said. They had the spiritual ears to hear and understand what he was saying. Verse 1, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. The interesting thing about Christ is that he was always seen in the presence of publicans and sinners. You may ask the question, why? Well, uh, they're the mission field. They're the ones that need Christ. A self-righteous person cannot be saved. That is, until they forsake their self-righteousness. Jesus was seen in the presence of publicans. One of his disciples was a publican. If we recall from Luke 19, verse 1 through 9, Jesus encountered Zacchaeus. Let me say Zacchaeus encountered Jesus. Now what did Zacchaeus do? Zacchaeus repented. He repented of his sin. It's interesting to see this too. The disciples of Christ associated with publicans and sinners. You would say, well, why? Uh, because Christ did. He's the example. They followed his example. And what we see here is despite the stern nature of Christ's message, the publicans and sinners were drawn to him. While at the same time, Jewish religious leaders were outraged. It brings to bear a biblical principle that we all have to know. And it's written by the Apostle Paul. He said, not many wise men after the flesh are called. Not many mighty are called. Not many who are noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. These people were despised by the majority of the population in Israel. They were despised by the Jewish religious leaders. And because of their leadership, they were despised by the majority. While publicans and sinners wanted to hear more, this is the reaction of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, the scribe, murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Interesting facts here. The word Pharisee means to be separated unto. Well, the Pharisees were separated unto the law of God. They were supposed to be the guardians of God's law. And as guardians of God's law, they should have known 
that God wants people to repent and get right with God. Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. That one who proclaims peace, who brings good tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation. How beautiful are the feet of those who do that. As guardians of the law, they should have known this instinctively, if you will. But rather than seeking to save the lost, the Pharisees held them in contempt because the Pharisees themselves were unsaved. What about the scribes? The scribes were doctors of the law. Most of the scribes were Pharisees themselves. They held to the Pharisaical traditions. And if there's one thing that a doctor of the law should have known from the Old Testament, which they were experts in, is that God had repeatedly sent prophets. Prophets. He sent prophets to the people. And they were always preaching, repent, repent, repent. That was their message. Repent or face the wrath of God. And you would have thought that somebody with that kind of education, somebody with that kind of knowledge of the law of God, the Old Testament, that they would have understood the need to seek and to save the lost. It's what the Old Testament prophets did. But instead they murmured. They grumbled and complained about Jesus associating with sinners. Let me tell you some interesting things that we know about the Pharisees from what has been written about them by Jewish people over time in history. The Pharisees loved those who agreed with them. Now let that sink in. The Pharisees loved those who agreed with them. That means they loved other Pharisees. Huh. They had nothing to do with the Essenes, the separatists, another separatist group. They just kind of went off and stayed by themselves. They had nothing to do with the zealots, those who sought freedom from Rome. Oh, they had nothing to do with the Sadducees. They had to work with them. They had no choice because they were in the Sanhedrin council, but they didn't get along either. Pharisees loved other Pharisees. Pharisees hung around other Pharisees. Pharisees did things with others who were Pharisees. You would have thought that they would have understood the Bible, given that they were masters of the law. How about that part that says, Deuteronomy 6, 5, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might. Uh, how about that part in Leviticus 19, 18 that says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And of course, they thought that their neighbor was the one who agreed with them on everything. Well, Jesus put that to rest in Luke chapter 10, verse 30 through 37, when he taught about the Good Samaritan. We've already been there. We've already preached on that months ago. If you remember that sermon, who is your neighbor? Everybody that's not you. 
Everybody that's not you, that's your neighbor. Even to the point where in Matthew 5, verse 44 through 48, Jesus said, not only that, love your enemies. Do good unto them. Pray for them. Yeah. Love your enemies. Very different than what they believed. So basically, the Pharisees, they divided people into two classes of people. The righteous, of whom they counted themselves to be the righteous, and the unrighteous, pretty much everybody else. And today, there are professing believers who do the same. They look at themselves like, I'm all that. And everybody else is below them, way down here. That was the attitude of these false religious leaders. So much to the point that from Jewish history we read that rabbis even refused to teach them the word of God. Can you imagine something like that? The rabbis even refused to teach them the word of God. Well, the question comes down to how is somebody supposed to get right with God? Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17, and hearing by the Word of God. Well, how is somebody supposed to hear the Word of God if no one is sent to them? Romans 10, 14. In order for somebody to hear the Word of God, they have to have somebody that takes the Word of God to them. This was totally contrary to what they did. I like what the Apostle Paul said about this. 1 Corinthians 9, 20 through 22. Paul's testimony of taking the gospel to the people. Unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To those who are without law is without law that I might gain them that are without law. Paul says to the weak I became as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Paul's testimony. He got it. He got it. In Luke 19.10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was the purpose of coming to this earth, to seek and to save that which was lost. And I want you to know that Jesus rejoices in the salvation of the lost. Amen. And the religious leaders, they have no interest at all. Because as we stated earlier, they themselves are lost. Matter of fact, in Matthew 15, verse 14, Jesus called them blind leaders, leading the blind. Look here in verse 3. Jesus resorts to teaching a parable. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he finds it? It's interesting parables. 
What is a parable? A parable takes one truth and puts it beside another truth in order to illuminate that truth. And most often, parables use natural, physical things to explain spiritual realities. An interesting side note here, given who Jesus is dealing with, scribes, Pharisees, publicans and sinners who want to hear him, there were times when Christ used parables so that those who had no spiritual insight to truth, in other words, those who were void of truth, could not see the truth when it was presented to them. While at the same time, those who can perceive the truth would get it. From Matthew 13, 10 through 12, the disciples asked Jesus, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever has, to him shall be given. And he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even what he does have. Therefore, I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. But Jesus says, but blessed are your eyes, for they see. In your ears, for they hear. Remember in Luke 14, 35, Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so Jesus tells the parable of a shepherd. What man of you having a hundred sheep will not go and search for the one that is lost? Two things here. I want everybody to recognize in the context of the passages of Scripture we've been preaching, verse by verse, we see back in Luke chapter 13 and verse 15, and Luke chapter 14 and verse 5, that the Pharisees had more concern for their animals than they had for people who were suffering. In Luke 13, 15, they would water and feed their animals on the Sabbath, but they were insulted when Jesus healed people on the Sabbath. One example. From Luke 14, 5, they would pull their animal out of a pit on the Sabbath, but they would refuse to help a suffering person on the Sabbath unless it was a matter of life and death. And Jesus rebuked both of those ideas. Any good shepherd will search for a sheep that wanders away and gets lost. Any good shepherd. But the Pharisees were not good shepherds. They abused the sheep and they scattered the sheep. Matthew 9, 36, Jesus said the sheep had no shepherd. When Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted, were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Now in those days, it would be common in Israel especially to see shepherds tending their sheep. And those people that Jesus was talking to in this day would have certainly been familiar because they're Jews. They would have been familiar with God being the good shepherd. 
For instance, Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The good shepherd who provides for his sheep. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. Speaking of God. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. The good shepherd cares for and safely guides the sheep. Ezekiel 34, verse 11 and 12. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. So will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered. Ezekiel 34, verse 15 and 16. I will feed my flock. And cause them to lie down, thus saith the Lord. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. The good shepherd cares. For the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which is lost. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, last week, we had two people get baptized. We had two people get baptized last week. It's time to rejoice. Because baptism is a public confession of an inner faith in Jesus Christ. Time to rejoice, because heaven rejoices. It's time to celebrate. And this shepherd, verse 5, when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. For the shepherd searching for his lost sheep... Once it's found, he takes the sheep and puts it over his shoulders. And he carries it home. He delivers it safely. That sheep that was formerly lost. Why does the shepherd rejoice? Because the sheep wasn't devoured. The sheep wasn't caught by a predator. Sheep had not perished. And notice the shepherd invites others to join in celebrating with him. Because the sheep was found by the shepherd who cares. I say unto you that likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents more than over 90 and 9 just persons which need no repentance. This is what a parable does. Remember, a parable takes physical things and puts them beside spiritual truth to illuminate spiritual truth. That's what a parable does. In the same manner in which the shepherd invites others to rejoice with him because he found his lost sheep, heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. Praise God. The rejoicing is because the sinner has been redeemed. A sinner's been delivered from the domain of Satan and been transformed, been transferred in the kingdom of God. As Colossians 1.13 says, delivered from the power of darkness, translated into the kingdom 
of his dear son. Joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. What does it mean to repent? Most important. Madanao in the Greek, it means to change your mind. Repentance is a change of mind. A conviction that someone has been traveling the wrong road and needs to go a different direction. Repentance is a change of mind that results in a different direction. There's joy in heaven over one sinner that changes his mind about God, changes his mind about sin, changes his mind about judgment, and changes his mind about eternity. What about the 90 and 9 just persons which need no repentance? Well, by now I think you've caught on to the fact that Jesus is referring to the Pharisees. They think they have no need for repentance because they're righteous in their own eyes, self-righteous. They are the ones who complained against Christ for associating with publicans and sinners. They are known to justify themselves and look down on others that they do not think are as good as they are. but they despise others. Luke 18, 9 through 12, Jesus spoke a parable about the self-righteous Pharisee. And he spake this parable under certain of those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray The one a Pharisee and the other a publican, a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, saying, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican over here. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess, What did the self-righteous Pharisee do? He just spent time telling God how good he was. Self-righteous. But there was that publican who got it right. By the way, the Pharisees hated the publicans. And the publican standing afar off would not so much as lift up his eyes into heaven, but smote among his breasts, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what it takes. I tell you, the words of Jesus here, I tell you, this man went down to his house rather, I mean justified, rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, That means put down. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The Pharisees exalted themselves. Jesus just said that they shall be humbled one day. And the humbling will come from the wrath of God. You know, a good teacher is a teacher that is pleased with students who study diligently. Any teachers out here in the audience in the congregation will know what I'm talking about. A good teacher is well pleased 
with students who study diligently to learn. A good teacher is also very displeased with students who do not study at all because they think they know it all. Amen? The Pharisees thought they knew it all. They thought they had it all. But as a group, they were spiritually dead and headed for hell. So while heaven rejoices over the salvation of one sinner, the Pharisees brought no glory to God, no rejoicing. They're self-righteous. They don't see the need for Jesus. They reject God's plan of redemption. They have no hope for salvation. They're as lost as can be. And this is a valuable lesson for us today, is it not? The mission of the church, I want to make this very clear, and I've spoken on this many times previously. But the mission of the church is to make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all whatsoever I have commanded you, thus saith the Lord. How can you make disciples of people? How can you go into all the world and make disciples without seeking for the lost sheep? Without sharing the word of God? It's impossible without going to the lost. Jesus is the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. He rejoices over one sinner that gets saved. Because it was Jesus who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God this very day. Heaven rejoices over one sinner who gets saved. With every head bowed, with every eye closed, there's joy in heaven over the glory and the greatness of God's work of redemption through Jesus Christ. A self-righteous person cannot be saved until they recognize that their righteousness is nothing more than filthy rags. Jesus said, he who has ears, let him hear. Has the Spirit spoken to your heart today? Today is the day. Now is the acceptable time. How will you respond?